Fantastic. Yes. I thought I'd break with research tradition and actually use some uh, put it on the board and the screen, but it's something I've not used before in public. So if it goes wrong, then that's fine. Ben Goldberg will approve. Um, my name is Stephen Locker. I'm a deputy head of primary school. Uh, are there any primary practitioners? Fantastic. You are the other two. Oh, the other three. Hallelujah. It seems to be very, very uh, secondary then, but I'm sure there are things that I can add uh, to that. This is not something I'm qualified in, but something I'm quite passionate about, um, as hopefully we'll come across. So I'll just read it. I won't read it because you can read that, obviously. Um, it's not working, there we are. Perfect. Good. Um, how many of you have got smartphones? Can you just grab your smartphone out for a moment, please? And I'll ask you a favour. If you could just take a picture of this for me, just as an experiment. Nice picture. A little bit of glare there. Marvelous. Well, I'm going to show you a picture each minute for 40 minutes, and that is my presentation. Does anyone want to touch it? I've seen it before. Does anyone recognise the picture? Everyone feeling slightly guilty about the fact you've just taken a photograph of something that could be copyrighted or not copyrighted? <laughs> Do you own the copyright to that photo? If you want to publish it or not? Have you broken the law? If so, how would they find out? Uh, I'm not going to answer any of those questions, but it's a lovely picture, nonetheless. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the, the mess that is copyright and provenance, and how it affects education and, and the decline of provenance, and I will explain what provenance is, for those of you who aren't sure. I had to look it up as well, uh, but it's a great word. Um, we all recognise this phrase, it does exactly what it says on the tin, and I've put Ron Seal there just in case you didn't know it was Ron Seal. Um, in 2011, Maggie Ramage from the Institute of Trademark Attorneys uh, was on record as saying that she was amazed that Ron Seal had trademarked this popular phrase. And, they, and she felt, thought it was ethically wrong that they'd taken an everyday phrase and trademarked it. Which is interesting because actually Ron Seal had created the phrase in 2004 as part of a marketing strategy and they had tra uh, trademarked it and she wasn't aware of that. So she was condemning their use even though it completely complied with all their uh, restrictions. I spoke to one of the people who created the phrase and he said that it was trademarked but they were more than happy for people to use it because of course the more you use that phrase the more it associates with Ron Seal. In fact they gave permission for Katie Malua who is um, an artist I use that in a loose term, but, um, you know, for microwaving the sound you too, and she called one of her out, one of her songs does exactly what it says on the tin. And Ron Seal were really pleased with that because it just furthers the brand, doesn't it? So there's some uncertainty about who owns what, even from the highest order. Uh, if, if the trademark attorneys aren't sure who owns the trademark, where do we go? Um, we've got this difficulty of the cult of everything is for everyone, and the ability to share is great, but it, with it comes a whole lot of responsibilities that are assumed that people are following and practicing, which is quite worrying, because people don't follow uh, policy correctly, and people do adjust things. So I've got some examples from education, and it began with Dr. Ben, this is him uh, pre-hair, um, <laughs> and he released his paper in March or April, and I was really pleased when I read it, I found it fascinating and it really excited me, and he gave lots of references to medical examples and then at the end there was no citation and, I, and no sources and, it, and I felt a bit despondent and a bit pathetic as well because it's not something that I would have necessarily looked up and checked his sources but I thought the fact that he didn't put them didn't give any um, heavy weight to his argument because I thought well he's just bringing it out there and hopefully people won't ask him so I was a little bit disappointed that he didn't um, cite any of his sources uh, and I, th I think it's important to, even in a very, what was, light document that he sent out as a call to arms. Uh, I don't know if you can see this right up, it's very uh, familiar, hopefully. You may have seen these facts about, uh, that you remember 10% of what you read, 20% of what you see, 30% of what you hear, 50% of seeing and hearing, 70% of collaboration, which I think is probably seeing and hearing and reading twice, and then 80% of doing. Have we seen that diagram or that graph, know that data? Isn't it convenient that it works out as exact increments of 10? Is that not slightly suspicious? Does that not unnerve you slightly? And uh, 
Back in 2006, a guy called uh, Will Thalhemer in America started researching this and trying to find out the source of this. And it seems quite easy because it's cited at the bottom. That's where the information comes from. So he, he did a very complicated route of emailing the researchers themselves. <coughs> and they came straight back saying, no, no, it's not us. So someone's created a graph and published it using a citation that actually is fictitious. And the difficulty is that we can look at that at first glance, think it's valid, and then pass it on and believe it to be truth because uh, there's a shallowness of research that we trust the summary that's given to us. Um, and I wondered how difficult that was to do. So I challenged myself. I thought, let's, let's look at one of these knowns uh, and see how hard it is to find out whether it's true or not. And I used a complex research tool called Google uh, and we really went for it. And the one I was looking at was the 7% rule. Now, do, does anyone know the 7% rule? No. Okay, the 7% rule is that if someone is giving a, a talk, then actually uh, the words qualify as 7% of that talk, or the impact of that talk. The rest is in uh, tonality of voice, body language, that sort of thing. So the 7% is for the words, 93% for everything else. You may have seen this graph. So it's saying the pressure on a speaker is on, uh, yeah, thank goodness it is, this is in metric, um, is the way you, you use your body, and the 7% is just the words, just the, the type of speech, as it were. This is bandied around a lot, so I started researching to see whether it was true or not, and it took me two minutes to discover that it isn't true. The research is accurate, but the way it's been skewed is completely inaccurate. It was done not on speeches, but on single words and as a measure, so the results are right, but it's not about uh, talking or telephone manner or speech making or presentations or teaching. It's on a very, very discreet, small scale study. In fact, only two studies, which makes it not a rule at all in an academic sense. Um, and yet, this graph appears online loads of places. If you search for the 7% rule in Google Images, the first 12 images that come up are this, uh, and almost some of them more than this saying this is, you know, you've got to remember that 7%, that's all it accounts for. Uh, and yet, the research has been skewed, and it's not, it's not accurate, and the message that's being given is not completely accurate. And if you look for the 7% more on Twitter, everyone just broadcasts it freely um, without actually looking at the provenance or where that information came from. Here's another example. This is William Blake's poem. If you have a little read through of it, called Two Sunflowers. That's an extract from Two Sunflowers. Now, could you write your response? No, no, I'm not really. Um, <coughs> it is a classic William Blake poem. It's a classic William Blake poem. It, it follows uh, his patterning. It uses the phraseology he would use. It's almost textbook William Blake, and thank goodness, because William Blake is out of copyright. So you can broadcast this poem freely. Except, of course, that William Blake, 200 years ago, wouldn't have used the Americanized version of travelling, which is a little clue to the fact that actually this was written by an American poet called Nancy Willard uh, in 1981, in a published set of poems in America uh, as an ode to uh, William Blake. And some students looked at this, and in 2001, an American website called ThinkQuest gave an example and associated it with William Blake. And you thought it might have ended there, except it hasn't. So in 2013, uh, it was discovered that this poem has been published as William Blake in school textbooks across the country. It's on the TES Resources website, and it's still out there. Um, so any William Blake fans who want to create some poems that are out there, you can become William Blake in three clicks. Uh, it was the research done by uh, Library Spider, and that's the blog uh, that uncovered this. Really good, and, and they were hoping that by publishing the information that it's false, um, that the message would spread. Now, I don't think it's going to, because it's very hard, once you get something out there, to then chase it up and say, no, it's completely wrong, it's completely false. Um, so, I wouldn't be surprised if this is not still being taught in five years' time as being classic and in black. And again, it's a very clear path for a teacher We're looking for William Blake and looking for William Blake worksheets. Boom, here's one with two verses and an analysis. Um, there's a real potential, isn't there, to make up a fictitious poem. poem. I'm really desperate to do that, but obviously I've got a knife. Um, 
We are surrounded by hallowed speakers today, and myself, and you'd have thought that these people would uh, be very, very scrupulous in their provenance and in their copyright. Um, and certainly I'd hope that anything that they've got published regarding what they're talking about today would have sources, although Dr. Gold over in. Um, and it would take a really sad man who didn't create a William Blake poem to go to the blogs of all of these people and see if they did quote uh, the source of their information and identify who made their images. It would take a really sad man. And I'll show you that information at the end because you'll be really surprised how many of these speakers haven't quoted where they got their information from and haven't cited their photographic sources. So these are the people leading us in research is important and you must listen to my research, but at the same time, I'm not actually going to show provenance or copyright respect for the people whose ideas I'm taking. And that's part of my frustration as a small bit there. Okay, so some definitions for you. This is the copyright definition from Wikipedia, which as we know is a good source of information. <laughs> I'll let you read through it and then I'll identify where the wiki part of Wikipedia goes wrong. <coughs> Um, obviously, yes, the right to copy it, and that's giving a permission. And the only problem I've got with this, interesting, the only definition that I've got, I've got a little bit of a problem with this with the definition is any expressible form of an idea, <coughs> which in fact is inaccurate. But you know, Wikipedia is not known for that, so we'll ignore that. Um, here are the basics of copyright law in about two minutes. Uh, uh, it's different country to country, so you need to be really specific about what you're copying and where you're going to publish that information. And it's covered by civil law. And the difference between civil law and criminal law is quite simple. Criminal law, you are innocent until proven guilty. Civil law, if you've uh, broken a copyright, you are prosecuted. It's as simple as that. Uh, and it often includes fines. The two main rules are that literary, dramatic, music or artistic works are the artist's death plus 70 years. So I write a fantastic best-selling book, I then die this year, um, and you've got 70 years before you can publish that, um, with, with, uh, it goes into the public domain if you like. There is one book that is protected by law from this rule itself. Does anyone know that book? Any thoughts oh. on a very famous book that might Peter be Pan. Peter Pan, J.M. Barry, yes. Because uh, that I live in a small village, and he's the local village butcher, and he's an amazing guy because you can buy an amazing steak from Steve, and he can give you the provenance of that steak. And what that means is he can tell you uh, what cow it came from, when that cow was slaughtered, the field that that cow lived in, what that cow was fed, sometimes even the name of that cow, although we don't tend to ask that too much. Uh, and that is provenance, it's being able to trace back the thing to the source. Now in steaks, there's a, there's a health reason for that, for that provenance. In education, we're seeming to lose the need to go back to that source, and my argument is that we do need to be able to see where the source of an idea comes from. If it's not protected by copyright, and we know that people are abusing copyright, then we should be able to exploit where the, uh, an idea comes from and trace back to that source. This is why it's important in education. It leaves thinking intact, undiluted, and traceable. And those are the pretty key things for me as to why it should be chased up and followed up. We go through those three then. If we have the provenance of an idea, we can see where the idea actually came from. You can see the genesis of that idea and also the problem that it solved. Now that's not to say that an idea can be changed. Ideas should be agile. Uh, but if we look back at the source of an idea, we can see what it was trying to solve and how it's been changed to improve new problems. So it may be that you come to an idea or a, a moment of thought on someone's blog post and think that's interesting. But the ability to be able to exploit where that idea came from may help you further. And more and more people are putting up blog posts which are thoughts and reflections, but sometimes don't link back to where those thoughts actually came from. And I think that if they did, it would become a much richer reading environment for you. Rather than further reading, <coughs> I want previous reading, and actually where your inspiration came from. Provenance allows you to undilute an idea. 
If you look at AFL, for example, Dylan Williams researched AFL, mm -hmm. and he turned it into a very, very simple package. And then everyone interpreted that package completely differently until Dylan William had to go back and go, you've got the wrong idea. But because the package was there, people could trace that provenance back. But it still took him banging his drum to make sure that people were actually getting the right idea because of provenance. But lots of ideas happen like that, and ideas can be diluted. I spoke to Ewan McIntosh um, about this, and he said that sometimes an idea gets taken so much and diluted so much that it's like being beaten, uh, with a mediocre stick. But the, the good concept has taken so much that it's actually broken down into something that's really not very beneficial for its original purpose. That's not to say that it's not useful. The last thing about provenance is that it's traceable. So if we look at something that Ewan was involved in from the, the office, Teach Meets, and Teach Meets <coughs> have evolved and changed, and as soon as uh, someone challenges a Teach Meet, everyone is able to, able to rush back and go, well, this is the source, was the, this was the actual purpose of the teaching at the very beginning. And this, is, this was the inherent idea, the, the, the founding philosophy, if you like. Without that traceability, we can't do that journey, which I think is really important. Uh, but that's not to dismiss the fact that we can hear things and absorb them and not necessarily actively remember them. Uh, in 1903, uh, Mark Twain wrote to Helen Keller, who'd been taken to court uh, because she had published a short story called uh, uh, Frost King, and uh, someone else had written a story called uh, Frost Fairies, and the short stories bore an uncanny resemblance to each other. And Helen Keller was actually uh, acquitted in the end, because they said there are some connections, but it's, it's tenuous, you know, the titling and some characters. And Mark Twain wrote a letter to her, and, and, and this is sort of the summary of it, so some more reading for her, I do apologise, too much reading to That, that sums up me to a T. Nothing I think about is actually original, but is pitched from lots of different places, lots of different ideas. You know, even my own children are produced by two people, two ideas. They're not an original idea at all. Um, and I think that we can acknowledge the fact that we take ideas from other places, but I think it's worth admitting that we don't own an idea, but it's a collaboration. <coughs> Pete? Well, we do that, we shouldn't call it magpie. We shouldn't call it magpie. In fact, you're absolutely right, because the, the magpie is a, is a stealing bird, isn't it? It's a, it eats its own young. It's a disgusting creature. You're not a fan of magpies? No. <laughs> yeah, there's a venerate the act of being a magpie as being is just disgusting. I think there's... <laughs> <laughs> I'll write down venerate you, but I'll it's, it's a good point. Um, yes, uh, that is part of the culture, isn't it, of, oh, I'll magpie that. Mm. And what you're actually saying is, I'll steal that. Rather than saying, can I borrow that, can I change it, can I show you what I did with it, can I adjust that, I'll magpie that is uh, the legitimised steam of an idea. In fact, there's a Twitter account that I saw recently called, that I did follow called Magpie That because I was just fascinated by what they do and they do just publish other people's things. It's nice standing on the shoulders of uh, small giants. So where do we lay the blame? But do you think this is a problem? You've been, you've been very quiet because I've been waffling too much. Do you think there's a problem? Have you had ideas stolen? I, yeah. it's, it's also a problem in terms of getting to quality information that is actually valid and not what people say is best practice mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, you know, the AFL thing is a perfect yeah. example of something that has become best practice simply because it rises to the top of Google. Yes. Rather than <coughs> actually what the original idea was. Because people don't go back and cite the original idea. People say, AFL, well, that's come from local authority, so it must be true. That's as far as yes. they go. They don't yeah, it is right to go back yeah. to the guy who thought about it, mm -hmm. looking at what it did. In fact, um, somebody did that on a blog just recently. Um, well, fed back from. No, wrote about AFL and about what a stupid idea it was, but didn't refer back to that's the original brilliant, idea. Isn't it? That's brilliant. I really hate your painting. What painting? What yeah. <laughs> 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 Uh, speaking to you, and he firmly believed that actually the rise of sharing tools and social media tools uh, were to blame. And I think that is true because it's so easy to share. And in fact, everything is sharing. I've got a friend who works in a branding agency, and uh, Burger King are launching a new logo soon, but you don't know that. And their aim was sharing. 
Okay, now if someone shares my Burger King, I'm quite grateful actually because they can be poisoned. Um, but, but, but they wanted to have a logo that shows sharing, and everything is everything's got a blooming share button now. Yes, yeah, so we're going to try and spread the love. No, it's about <coughs> enhancing that brand identity. Um, Twitter is to blame to a lot of an extent because it's so easy to share, and and it takes two seconds, doesn't it? And do we research everything all the time? No, we don't. We see a good phrase. I love that one of the um, Albert Einstein. Uh, if you teach a, if you ask a fish to climb up a tree, if you judge everyone by the same standard, that I should, <laughs> yeah, I should have got a picture on with some more words. Uh, but that's been proven to be not Albert Einstein even. Oh, oh there we are. <laughs> <laughs> If you just ignore that bit and, and do what I said, yeah, that was, yes. Can, can I just quibble with your yes. saying that, that this media is to blame because it just makes it easier. Um, it, it's it's us who press the button and decide, and it's us who share something without acknowledging where we where we got it from, and it's us. That, that don't perhaps take that step to investigate, well, is that true? Where did that come from? Who cited that? Um, so I, I think that's just a, a little bit too easy um, yeah. to say that, oh, it's the fault of social media. It's, it's, we're making the, the choice. And we're not to do what should. It's a in there, doesn't it? Because if, if you see something on Twitter... It's, any, it's fair play. It has it's out there no anyway. provenance. So it's just, I, I could say to you, well, that wall over there is green. And if I can't prove it to you, then it isn't. And the, another thing is, most of the social media, too, when you share, you at least cite that thing you immediately share, right? Yeah. So if the original thing is, is its own thing, it does have the right problem. So I feel a bit different issue. Because you, you are saying the problem, like when you call someone else, is, they don't see where it came from. All these share with them, that's exactly what it does, it rip it back. Is it inside? Yeah, I totally agree with you, which is why I put the next slide up. Um, two minor details. You're absolutely right. They offer a level of provenance built in. And in fact, the best one of all is Facebook, because it goes back to the original poster. So they do build in provenance. Um, what they don't do is they don't build into it because they're not able to, they're not able to build in that bit where it goes from someone's desktop onto Facebook. So they do first contact provenance, if you like. So you're absolutely right. And in fact, in the terms and conditions, it is all on the user. They've got no moral obligation to search for copyright, and they will stamp down clearly on it. But Twitter, in their um, terms of use, it respects the intellectual property rights of others and expects users of the services to do the same. They will close your account if it's proven that you are using copyrighted material. So I totally agree with you. I do totally agree with you, because it's very easy to blame the tools and say, there's a share button, it's already offering problems. But it is actually our responsibility as users. You know, we've got a moral, we have a moral obligation to give credit. It's a question of discernment, isn't it? And as educators as well, we should be teaching the students to acknowledge this idea of problems, but the discernment of what you're going to use in what context and how and for what for what reason should also be, I think, very much at the forefront of our minds when we are putting on these pictures or, or these resources and, and not acknowledging where they come from. Absolutely, I agree. So here's my solution, and I'm not saying that these are perfect solutions, these are solutions that I'm trying to explore because I haven't sussed it myself. Um, I read a book recently called The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg, and he said that habit can be broken down into three things, uh, cue, routine and reward. So I'm a bit bored, uh, uh, that's my cue, feeling a bit bored, I need a distraction, my routine is that I probably go down to the kitchen and have a cup of tea and then I have a biscuit. Uh, my, role, my reward is the drink, and I feel a bit satiated and I'm not bored anymore. The cue is always going to be there, and the reward is always going to be needed. And it's about changing this routine. So when we're looking at things like provenance and copyright, the cue is I need a picture, the reward is I've got the picture, and what we need to change here is the routine, where we get that picture from and what we do with that picture. And with information, it's exactly the same. I need some information, I get that information, I'm pleased with that information, but I need to show where that information came from. It's a really interesting book, but also, that is the book in three words. Um, but it is a good book. Uh, so here are some ways that you can get uh, that provenance and copyright. Creative Commons is a brilliant website. It makes it really easy for you to copyright your own image, uh, but not more than copyright. It, it gives a traceable source and says exactly what people can do with that image and that text and your uh, 
blog posts, your papers, um, and it's very, very simple. I think that the copyright concept itself is very complex, The Creative Commons makes it uh, stupid easy. And I don't mean to this in a derogatory way, but uh, I teach in a primary school and I teach 10 and 11 year olds about Creative Commons, and they get it. And we talk about issues and have dilemmas and they get it. If 10 year olds can get it, then all the researchers uh, doing talks today can surely get it. Uh, in terms of Compfight, this searches Creative Commons images for you. So rather than going to Google <coughs> Images, which my children would naturally do, because it's a really easy thing, one click, borrow that image, and in the tiniest writing that they wouldn't use for advertising, Google will say, this may be subject to copyright. Well, it probably is, actually, yes. It's almost certainly uh, down to copyright. And Compfight allows you to search Creative Commons images, and with one button, it allows you to give that all the necessary copyright provenance uh, in one click. And they've got a, word, uh, got a WordPress add-in, and it's really, really simple. My children can use it, adults can. If you want to pay for images, you can use something like Pickfair, which is one of the newest and cheapest, and it's user-generated images that you can share, and some you have to pay for. Um, I, think it's, I think we have a moral responsibility to chase and question provenance and copyright. Um, and it's huge fun to see something that someone's put up and uh, say, great image, or great, great graphic, where did you get it from? And you'll often get someone chasing back, oh, I'm not sure someone passed it on to me, but it does make someone think about, rather than just sharing something, thinking about its origin. It's a great fun, there are more fun things to do, but you get the idea. We need to clear the path and be the example for everyone else. So I've come up with a beautiful acronym of TEAM. Um, uh, teach, educate, ask and model. Uh, I've taught uh, year three, which is seven and eight year olds, how to cite their work. And Google make it fantastically sim simple uh, in Google Documents. There's a button called Research. It comes up with a cite toolbar. They can type in what they're researching. Then there's another button that says Cite. And it does it as a really nice little footer with a footnote. And it's very dynamic. And children get it. They get the reason. And you can challenge children and say, where did you get your source of information? And, and, it's, and it's possible, and they get the idea, because they don't like the idea of someone stealing their idea. You've ever heard a child say, they're copying me? Yes. They're indignant. And I, I say, you know, copying is a reflection, it's a, it's a compliment, in fact, if someone's copying you, because they think your idea is better than theirs. We should also show where that idea is coming from. So we need to educate, not just children, but adults as well, and ask people where they got the information from. <coughs> and we need to model it ourselves. Uh, and I've become much better uh, I'm not saying that I'm perfect in any way, but I've become much better at crediting my sources and crediting my ideas, uh, and especially my images. And I say my images because about five years ago I used an image, and it was an image from Google Images, shame on me, and I was fined for it, uh, because it was actually an owned image. So I had to pay uh, over £250 because I used that image without my permission. And if you look at, that, at, the, at some of these photographic companies, they employ agencies to trawl through the internet looking for images. There's a site called PicScout that does exactly that. Uh, so it's a, it's a warning shot, and I suppose that was the genesis of my idea, apart from being hugely pissed off. Um, <laughs> and more, more so that I'd made the mistake, and I'd been really foolish in just grabbing an image and thinking, that's a great image, it must be free, to actually thinking, Someone had taken that image and, and used it, and I've used it without giving them any credit or even paying for the permission. Stephen, where did you use that picture? I used it on someone's website. I built a website for someone. Right. As an IT teacher, you get asked to fix your mum's computer a lot and asked to build websites, and I used that picture. Right. And it was a, it was a tiny picture of pancakes. <laughs> Not that I'm bitter. Um, so uh, I'm just going to leave you with minus, uh, Garfield minus Garfield. Um, Garfield obviously you'll know as a cartoon strip, which isn't funny. And this chap, uh, I've got his name, John. sorry. Isn't it John? Dan Walsh. Oh. Jim Davis writes Garfield, and Dan Walsh thought, wouldn't it be interesting if you took away the main character of a cartoon? And so he's created this strip of cartoons where Garfield is removed, and it's, and it's the existential life of John, who's living on his own, talking to himself in suburban America. Uh, and and they're, they're brilliant. And as soon as you get the idea, these are hilarious to look at. And he was a sort of naughty boy for doing it. Uh, but what was really nice is that Jim Davis wrote to him saying, I love it. I love the idea. I love the fact that you've skewed it. And he kept 
the link in and he kept the credits. So he was actually doing something that was allowed as its fair use. But what was really nice is that it was endorsed by um, Jim Davis himself. So there is play with this, and I think if you show credit and, and show playfulness, you can be rewarded. And I would recommend going to the site uh, if you're incredibly bored at work. So last okay. minute, uh, it's out of copyright. Monet, Monet uh, did this painting. Um, and it's now, it's called Impression Sunrise. Now, the light's not great in here, um, but it's, I'm sure it's a lovely, lovely picture. It's owned by the Musée Marmaton in Paris, and the picture itself is copyright free. Okay, so it's in public domain. However, to be very clever, they have taken a photograph and they've taken the best photograph possible because they've taken that photograph, that's what they own, that's their <coughs> copyright. They, have, they literally have a license to print money. <laughs> 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 All about that. Um, they're very clever because you think you're buying a copyrighted image, you're, you're buying a copyrighted photograph. So you are all within your rights to upload your photograph of Monet to pick there and send it because it's a copyright free image. Um, so here are my links should you want to know any more. What I've done is I've tried to experiment with uh, citation myself. So what I've done is I've, I've come with this idea called open citation. It may only happen once. What I've done is I've written down all my ideas, <coughs> where I've got all my images. This is the most cited talk you will hear today, believe me. But I want you to pick through holes if you can. I've, I've put it on an open Google Doc, so you'll feel free to comment on it, and I'll leave the comments and I will change things. And if you think I've missed stuff out or stolen other ideas, go for it. Um, you know, I'm here, now to slaughter. And I've put on there where I've got all my ideas from further reading and other suggestions and ideas. Um, has anyone got any... Probably not any questions. I don't normally talk this fast with my children, but uh, I hope I've given an idea of the problems of copyright. And wondered if anyone had anything to say or share. Yeah, I've got a question. 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 Yeah, I've got a I think because the tools are simple, it makes us feel that the transaction is simple, but actually yeah. we do need to make thought over that transaction. Mm -hmm. And Bethan, you work with, <laughs> you work with, you work with uh, researchers and undergraduates. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is, is this sort of thing common? Well, yeah, so I, but I think this is where it's not about research ed and how can we you know, researchers and teachers work together. This is something that the academic community, which means we have to, you know, the importance of citation is absolutely paramount. It's something that we can um, you know, help, help out and work with practitioners to, to do. But I would say in my own, in the own academic world, I think the other point that's really struck me about your presentation, the importance of tracing things back. We're all here today now, uh, okay, it's not a brand new idea to see <coughs> teachers and researchers working together. I'm actually in a partnership that's been going for about, uh, not me in this partnership, but about 10, 15 years of people talking about schooling, schools and universities bridging the divide. But further back to that, going right back to the 1980s of people doing practitioner research like Stenhouse, Gene Ruddock, and if you know of the work at the University of East Anglia, okay, all of that and the importance of reading those people again and going back and discovering what people have said that's really valuable and not just starting from scratch, as it were. So that thing, I liked what you said about what I have led to, to bring yeah. in and not from what we should read next. So. I think that also, I mean, I'm fascinated by research, but I'm also incredibly lazy. And a lot of the research is hidden by a pay, behind a paywall. Or I'll just read the synopsis because it's 17 pages of stuff. And I think that blogs are on the increase exponentially and people read a blog rather than try and find their way behind a paywall or download a research paper. And yet, <coughs> in research, in research papers, you know, you have to, it's double blind, check tested and everything is very scrupulous and for a blog post, I can cite something, make it all up and put it online and no one checks it. Um, and I'm not saying we should go around checking anyone's blog posts, but sometimes blogs go up and they become, this is the law, this is how we do things. And I get things wrong all the time on my blog. 
uh, mostly spellings because I'm rushing, but uh, I, I do try and cite my sources where possible. But I think that, that that concept of stand by your argument, you know, show us where your ideas came from is really, really important. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, so that you mentioned about all the sharing tools, yeah. like YouTube or Pinterest. Uh, if someone, in the video's case, if someone like to make it from something like BBC or something like Apple, it's clearly a violation. But for example, if someone uploaded the teaching uh, uh, video or something, yeah. if that's in a like, social domain where that tool is still has a sharing button, does it by people mean that the author of the uh, content are giving to kind of gave you the copyright to use as long as there's a referral or does it depend on the it's, it's, it, That's really complex, isn't it? Because if you're putting it up there freely, are you saying that it's free, freely available for everyone? Yeah. No, you're not. Uh, actually, you're, what you're saying is I'm putting this up there for you to see, but I still own and retain the copyright. Yeah, the, the, the tool itself has a share button, yeah. right? Uh, sometimes I think some YouTube don't allow it. Like yeah. Some broad, if broadcast stuff, like for example, Jane Oliver's cooking video, actually you can't share. Yeah. So there's a tool to for in the YouTube itself to control that. If that's not controlled, why does it mean like it, I'm okay to just share? Yeah, absolutely, they don't want to share. I mean, ideally, that's because you watch the advert around them to, around them, around the uh, YouTube so that it funds it. And YouTube have got a very clever uh, algorithm that. that uh, say CNN will upload all their programs, they'll record all the <coughs> programs and, and look at the trace file between the program and things that up, get uploaded. So the best example for that uh, is the X Factor, which has a very, very strict takedown policy. So if you see someone uploading an X Factor act uh, on a Saturday night, it won't be there Sunday morning because the algorithms will work out that it's from the X Factor and uh, it is, it's a nice one, uh, 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 and they will, they will take that X Factor episode off. For the little people, it's up to you. You've got to chase through YouTube and try and find any links that you've got that you put up there. So it's, it's good for the big man, shame for the little man. Very quick. I was going to say, I it's really lame, but like, um, I put like, teaching ideas in my blog, and sometimes people do them and they tell me I tried your idea and they normally do it better than me. <laughs> and that's kind of cool and sucks all at the same time. But sometimes I've seen people presenting things that I thought of at teach meets, and like, I'm like, oh, that's really awesome, and kind of a compliment, but I did kind of think of that. And all it would have had to do was say, oh my, and this was... Yeah, that was exactly Ewan's point. It's, it's not so much I'm looking for the glory, I'm just looking for a thank you or, yeah, yeah. and this idea. And I think you're right, it goes back to the previous reading or previous viewing. Part of the problem is that people don't see that stealing a picture or stealing an idea is, is the same as stealing someone's property. Yeah. Yeah. So if I steal your jacket, it has a value. It, it doesn't have a value. But the concept, I get the concept. It has a value, yeah, so it's your, it's your property. Yeah. But that, 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 that idea that you had at Teach Me contributes to your reputation yeah. and means that you can earn more money or something from it. And when people start to pass off those ideas as their own and then earn money from those, yeah. Yeah. then that is, that yeah. is, and and that's, this, yes. this is a moral and ethical thing yeah. that is actually about treating people properly. And it's nothing to do with technology. Well, it's basically integrity, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, everyone, yeah. Provenance is integrity, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Take, absolutely. Um, credit for someone else's ideas, yeah. you know. I mean, we've all had bosses like that, I'm sure. <laughs> and, uh, and also, it's how they work. It's the first thing we've done. Things have gone missing from our staff room already. Incredible. Mm. We're all CRB checks, you know. Mm. Everyone has a job in court, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> and so, do these things, things are they, they cope or are they, are they, are they, are they ideas? Um, physical things. I, I was, yeah. The first example was ideas, you know, like yeah. initiatives, and then you're going to say, oh, If you put an image in, into a media that can be shared, and it's your image, and you don't say anything where it's come from or that it is your image, how is anybody else to know? Uh, it's the default yeah. position. So, is there some responsibility? Yeah, the rule is do you know you have permission to use it? Mm. It's mine. I've taken no, 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 that's fine, that's yours. But if yeah. I then see that, yeah. and there's nothing I need to say it's Creative Commons, there's nothing exactly. I need to say it's copyright, I do not know I have your permission to use it, so I should not use so it. So you should not, yes. Yeah. But if somebody puts an image onto Google Image, or it gets there, or whatever you mean by being on someone's blog, and then someone sees it, it's always a copyright at the bottom of that, and they just snip it so that it's missed off. Then they put it up, 
it's like passing on stolen memory. goods, though. Yeah. You still yeah. have yeah. the responsibility yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. to verify where they came from. If you buy stolen goods and pass them on, they're yours. Uh, absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.